going on, everybody? It's your boy, Rail, back with another review, man. Yo, it is Throne Thursdays, which means it is Game of Thrones Season 2, Episode 2. All right? Such an exciting day. I love Throne Thursdays. Now, first and foremost, salute to Discord gang, 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 those listening on Apple and Spotify Podcasts, and of course, you, the viewer. Are we ready to get into it? I am. First off, everybody say happy birthday to my baby girl. She turned seven yesterday. We turned up, teed up at the Museum of Ice Cream. It was a great time. Creepy. It was a bit creepy. Every room was pink. A lot of weird characters up in there, but when you're working at a Museum of Ice Cream, eh. But they were good people, but I'd watch them if I were you. Anyway, this one was an interesting episode. Really, this season feels like it's a race to the throne, right? Everybody, this episode is basically everybody figuring out who's who, who's with who, and how much we get, okay? That's pretty much it. And the Lannisters are figuring out internal issues right now. That seems to be the setup for episode two right now. Interesting enough, there was no Rob Stark. There was no Lady Stark. There was none of that. So their storyline has taken a backseat. We are now circling for uh, other characters. Now, first where I'd like to start is... uh, hmm, Let's start up north with Jon Snow and Sam. So they're out there, and in this one, we see Sam has been a frisky boy. He has, you know, he, there's nothing Sam loves more than books, than a woman. You hear that book, people? It gets better than books. All right. So he's been a little, he's been a little kinky. He's always asking questions. Oh, you've been, oh, how was it? He likes details. He's a nasty, nasty boy, that Sam. I like him though. You can't not like Sam. All right. So now he's out there with uh, the daughter wives. John and them, they just kind of chilling out. And he saves one of the girl's rabbits from Ghost. Because Ghost is hungry. He don't know what the hell going on. He's a giant dire wolf. Probably consumes a lot of calories a day, I would imagine. So, you can't just be bringing butt naked, delicious, skinned rabbits around him. Because it's going to go down that way. It's you or the rabbit. Alright? When it's a fucking dire wolf. You or the rabbit. But Sam came through, you know what I'm saying, because that's his good old little buddy. Shoot him away, and then he won the favor of one of the daughter wives of the nastiest man to the north. And I mean, there's a lot of nasty shit up there up north. But that dude is by far the nastiest creature north of the wall. Daughter wives? Okay. But uh, one of them reveals to Sam that she's got an issue. And who can Sam run to? It's only one person. That's John. He's like, John, I know this is a bad idea. I already know. But we got to save her. We got to save this one. Now, do I feel that Sam just wants to help her? Sure. But we clearly see that Sam got a little fire for her, right? They were staring at each other for a little too long. And she looks quite attainable for Sam, right? Let's just be real, people. Sam is not going to have his pickings of ladies. So this one looks right up Sam's alley. If you ask me like this is so he's he's not wasting any moments. He's like we need to rescue this one. Okay. And all this shit about oafs and all that goes out the door for Sam when it involves a woman. Maybe the same could be maybe the same could be said about John later on down the road. But uh, but, but but we're here now. Of course, John's looking at him crazy, but she does relay some information that interests the shit out of John. Last episode, he asked, what about the boys? What happens to the boys? Okay, nobody answered. Nobody cared. And nobody was curious, which I thought was pretty strange. That's a legitimate question. How do you just know you're having all girls? Or And if there's an off chance there is a boy, what do you do with him? Right? It's nothing good. Because there's no boys here. So there's nothing good. And John would like to know, what what is this? What's happening? So she tempts him and says, hey, I'm pregnant. And I don't know. It could be a girl, but in the case of a boy, 
we need to and he's like okay then what would happen you know he's interested cool now you got my now you got me interested if you want me to save you please you know and she wouldn't say but that wouldn't stop john because somehow there was a a boy born at i don't know i didn't see another pregnant woman i felt like that might have been the only miss in Game of Thrones. Well, it's probably a few of them, but it's one of the rare misses in Game of Thrones. I don't remember nobody else being pregnant and damn near due while they were there. Like, so a fresh baby was born somehow from some daughter. And, and now we get to see what happens to a boy. So, you know, nasty man comes and carries the boy out there. John is stalking him and then runs down sees the boy is scooped up and we see the blue eyes we see the blue eyes and then john turns around he's getting knocked out flat so that's pretty much what's going on up north so that means things about to turn a little hairy now interesting enough um since we haven't seen much of aria here she is and they got their own thing going on speaking of odd couples so Arya's out there meeting a strange talking gentleman who seems to be very nice to her. He speaks funny. A man would ask for a drink and this and that. And Arya seems to be very interested in this dude. He's weird. He's talking nice. And she may have feel like maybe he doesn't even belong in this cage. I can see why these other two assholes belong in there. We don't quite know what's to it, but it, it does drop a hint there. And on the rewatch, I would have never noticed. Like, she... He becomes such a large part in her life. It's so funny to see how it could be overlooked, how easily it's overlooked from the way he said, oh, a boy has courage. A boy is pretty dumb, but has courage. You know, and he takes a liking to Arya immediately, the way she holds her own. So, you know, I guess we know now, but that's a pretty interesting scene to watch. It's like, Oh, okay, cool. If this character ever pops up, or this could definitely be friendly. A friendly for Arya, which she doesn't have many. But she's got Gendry, and she's got a protector right now. Um, one of the, uh, the, the Knights of the Watch, of the Tower, you know. A couple of Lannister dudes, a couple of gold cloaks ran down on him. He gave him a good little threat, but they got to get out of there. Because he said, we will be back with more men. Now, me, I would have just murdered him. Right there. Why would you allow these two dudes to leave knowing he said, oh, we'll be back with more men? Right? He did this whole monologue about sharp knives, cutting femoral arteries, all these good threats. And then dude just looks, he's he's scared. But then he says, hey, it's a lot of money out there if y'all could bring me a dude named Gendry. Okay? And we will be back with more people. So, just letting everybody out here know that. Right then and there, he, they should have been murdered. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Why would you allow them type of problems to come your way? And they could run, they could ride faster than you transporting criminals, all type of shit. So, we know that this path to the wall probably likely is not going to happen. Because he just let a bunch of, he just let a couple soldiers leave to come, you know come back with force so that's that's always no good but we see something interesting these baratheon men they love them some stark ladies and right now the love may not be there but gendry definitely knows that she's a a girl tells Arya that and he's playful with her almost maybe like a big brother but you know it's always something to watch out because a Baratheon man is dead-ass serious about a Stark woman. We've been there before. Robert Baratheon, Ned's sister. So it's, it feels like, you know, something like that. And we know that Arya hates being called a lady. This and that. But, you know, she's playful with this Gendry. This is the most flirty we've ever seen Arya. Because she typically doesn't like boys. She wants to fuck them up. Because they talk shit. And this is why we love Arya. So, but we, we get a little bit of her, but now we know that she has somebody she could trust. Because we were all like, so everybody's just believing she's a boy. And I like how Gendry said, yeah, I'm not as dumb as everybody else is. 
and Arya was trying to figure out why they looking for Gendry, you know, and they, they haven't put it together yet. But right now, as it stands, Gendry is the last Baratheon heir. Right? He may not be the last Baratheon, but he's the last heir to the to the kingdom. Right? The rightful. And speaking of Baratheons, here comes Stannis. Stannis, now we get a we get a more understanding of Stannis and this god. He just kind of with this god because it's supposed to be beneficial. It doesn't seem like he believes in the Lord of Light that hard. But uh, I guess he's, we don't know why he even, this, this Red Witch is even here. Like, it seems like Stannis would be very dismissive of such things. But he must have seen something or experienced something with this woman and the Lord of Light that made him go, well, what the fuck? Just had him burn the ships if it's supposed to belong to me. So he just, he's frustrated. His younger brother has a giant army. Meanwhile, our boy uh, Davos is trying to get like a pirate army for him. He was able to muscle up about 30 ships. I love that conversation too. Actually, it's probably one of my favorite scenes. Uh, Davos and his uh, old um, pirate buddy. So we learned that Davos was an excellent smuggler. We learned that Stan Stannis cut off his fingers, probably stole from him, and gave him an acquittal and made him something better than a smuggler. Like, because the way Davos was talking to his, his son, he was like, you want me to believe in the God? Stannis is my God. He gave me station. He gave me purpose. He allowed you to become something I couldn't even imagine that I could bring to you because he was a smuggler. Like, he was a piece of shit. But now he's in this place of, like, nobility. And, you know, in times like that, like, that means something. Right-hand man to a, a a lord? That's pretty, that's an upgrade from just successful smuggler, right? So we see where his dedication for Stannis comes from. We've seen that he believes that Stannis is just. Like, he took his fingers, so he's a just man. He's going to get his. You ain't getting away scot-free. But he's also a man of integrity, and he can see something in you. So that shows that relationship, and it's a pretty deep one. And it shows that his son is very irritating. Like, he's super religious, super into his Lord of Light. And that could be frustrating to a father who could give a shit about some gods. You know, he likes tangible, on-earth things. Guys, okay, look here. Let's not start wars with this imaginary god thing. Like, let's kind of, let's assume that the god doesn't show up. So we need ships where we stand on this. So he's trying to like salvage some type of army for Stannis to at least compete. But it's looking bleak and Stannis knows it's bleak. And what is the Red Witch's um, answer for this bleakness? Let's get naked and um, you give yourself to the Lord of Light, a.k.a. me. And this will get the this will get the job done. You have sex with me. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I, I'm, I don't see how the two things correlate. But what I don't like is, Mr. Noble, Ned would never approve of you smashing his red, red woman when you have a lady wife at the crib, right? And some chick that's, de like, she was shit talking his wife. Oh, she gives you a stillborns and death and she's owed and bare. I'm like relax that's my woman you're talking about like where is the like come on man where's the protection for your lady wife like even if you don't like her like that you can't just be letting some outside hoe talk crazy about your woman like she's giving it all she's got she can't make these babies be born man it's medieval times they don't have to you don't have a grandmeister okay with the good tea with the um prenatal tea okay you need a Grand Meister for the tease, man. Stannis ain't got that. So what does he expect? Like, how are you supposed to nurture a baby in these harsh times? And that poor woman's under all that pressure. So I ain't like the red, the red witch talking that shit. You know what I'm saying? About his wife. That wasn't cool. And I like him just standing there accepting it and then going, well, you know what? I'm going to smash you. I mean, you're naked. You're red. You're here. I'm frustrated. 
I'll give you strokes. So I was just like, I don't know. Stannis is not seeming to be the man I thought he was last episode. <coughs> but he's no fool. He's no fool. He knows his little bro got a giant army, and he knows that the more men, you feel me, typically win in a battle. That's just kind of how it goes. Um, let's check in on our girl uh, Daenerys. So she's still out there in the red waste, wasting away. We didn't see any dragons this episode. They upped the budget, but not quite as much. So Game of Thrones is still earning their keep in season two. So I, I always like to keep an eye on that. I always like to go, what season was it that HBO said, oh, we're all in. Here's a, a duffel bag of money. Please hire the best CGI. Do what you want. Just I'm throwing cash at this thing. Go crazy. It definitely wasn't in season one. They gave them a bigger purse in season two, a bigger budget, but not the end all be all. Something tells me season three was the moment that the producers or the executive producers said, give it the green light. OK, there's people like rail running around here doing reviews on shit. They love this shit. Throw a bag of money at it. Green light. Buy what they want. Okay? I think that was season three. But, um, yeah, so our baby girl, Daenerys, she's wasting away at the in the red waste. And, it, and if that's bad enough, that she's not just starving to death and lips all chapped and barely can walk. Blood of my blood, blood of her blood, comes back bodiless. And ponytail cut, which was a key factor because a horse comes back with the owner's head in it and immediately um, Jorah notices that the ponytail is clipped. So that lets us know that another call did this. So whichever direction he fucking came from, there's people there for sure. There's life, but not quite what they're looking for. So he gave his life to let uh, Danny know that maybe we don't go that way, but that's, but that's it. It's like, she's going down bad. Everybody else else, maybe, you know, Aria, but she's not even in a rough spot. She has people, she could, she's got food. So yeah, it just seems like the, the, the pains that, that, uh, that Daenerys got to go through to really achieve greatness is happening right now. Like real leaders come from like experience and how you deal with being in the shit. Not when everything is going well. Anybody can do a lot of things when stuff is going well. How are you when it hits the shit? And she is still strong and she is vowing vengeance on the motherfuckers that murdered her, uh, her people. And I believe her. And they should too. So, but that's the story with Danny. That's how I was looking out there. Now, enter a new character. All right, this is this is probably, you know, my favorite scene, conversationally, dialogue wise. Mm, it's actually, it's actually three. It's actually three. I know I said the Davos and the pirate might have been one of my might have been my favorite scene, but now as I'm thinking about it, it's got some competition. Because Theon. Coming to the Iron Islands for the first time after so many years? Wow. The conversation with Balin, his father? Oh, my God. That's good shit. But first, let's talk about Theon's... Uh, 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 do we even got to talk about the shorty he was with down there? That just seemed creepy, right? Like, he just... I don't know. It was an uncomfortable scene because it, it, it appears that... She's a little slow, and it looks like he's just taking advantage of somebody that doesn't have it quite all upstairs. So that whole scene was a little cringy, right? Like, he'll just really fuck anything, and he'll ruin, like, that seems to be his thing. That's what he does. So we're just going to fast track that to when he's getting off the boat. And he touches down, and the first dude he sees, because he's trying to get to the castle, and he thinks he's saying, like, hey, I'm Theon Greyjoy. I'm the last, I'm the only true heir to, to Balon Greyjoy, the lord of this land. And dude's looking at him like, okay, the fuck you want? 
And I'm like, oh, this is not the greeting that Theon thought. No. And then here comes Yara riding up after hearing him spout all this shit about being, you know, the last remaining heir. So she pretends to not know who he is or who she is to him, which makes that horse ride disgusting. And that's what he gets. The way his face was when his father told him, your sister Yara, and she rolls in, he's like, ugh. And I'm like, yeah, ugh. Ugh to you. Keep your hand up. Like, leave. Why are you over-sexualized? You just got some in the boat. And here you are now fondling, okay, your little sister. How do you feel now? You just, Theon's a freak. But what the Greyjoys give me is Black Air Force One energy. Like, Balin is a walking, talking Black Air Force One. Like, that's all I envisioned. Just him. A ski mask. Imagine, if you will, not even a mid, a high top for ankle support. A high top Black Air Force One. And then you wrap a ski mask around it. Right? That would come close to Balin Greyjoy and the Iron Way. The way he pieced apart Theon on the walk-in. Oh, you look like a girl with all your fancy shit on. Talking about Lord this and Lord that. Like, oh, they really got to you. Yep, that was my fear. That they had turned you out. And he kept reminding him, like, oh, you making treaties and you're going to do all these promises for the man that killed your brother? That put your brothers to the knife? Did you, did you forget that? They killed your brothers, took you, and left me with shit. Just me and your sister. But I guess you don't mind all of that. And he's like, no, I haven't forgotten. And he got a, Theon got a harsh thing of reality. Like, his sister even broke him down. Look at these pretty hands. He ain't never pulled a rope. Yara killed men. She broke, she broke it down. Yara killed men. She's commanded men. She's going to lead my fight. And then she, you know, and Theon is just taking it back. But I'm a boy. I'm supposed to. Entitlement. He's an entitled little dick. And I love how Balin told him, yo, how did you uh, buy that armor right there? Gold or steel? You know, because or gold or iron. You know, the iron way, we kill. And then we take that up off of him. And it's ours. I said, oh, that's. That's heavy black. That's black AF1. That's a heavy black AF1 statement. Like he, like now I envision, like if we broke this up into cities, I would have to imagine (laughs) that the Greyjoys would be like Bed-Stuy, New York, like the Bronx. Like I heard that's like the grimiest area of New York. That that's got to be a BX thing, right? Somebody help me out with that. Is is that would that be about accurate? Like that that's that would be the great joys, cause he ain't playing. He was like, oh, and then when Theon had to answer with gold, he like, oh, stripped him of it. Like, fam, we earn every we we eat our kill here. All right, Balon is like everybody is food. This is what we do. We don't pay. We take. That's the Iron Way. And everybody on that island is just some salty assholes. Like, it's a rough place to come up. It's a rough place. But Yara seems to have a lot of personality. I will give her that, so that's something to watch. So, and then we do realize, like, uh, the Greyjoys will be in the fight. But when Theon yelled and said, "The Land, you can't beat the Lannisters by yourself. And he said, fight the Lannisters? So we like, oh shit. Anybody that's not against the Lannisters... Are even if they, it's a it's tricky because if they're not fighting the Lannisters, they're fighting somebody who's trying to take out the Lannisters and come to King's Landing and take over. So he's so the Greyjoys. We don't know if they're coming for Rob and some retribution. We don't know if they're trying to fuck up Stannis. Maybe take whatever man he got, collect that, or you know we don't know. So the Greyjoys right now are loose cannon. We don't know where their targets are aimed and what's the motivation behind it. But we know one thing. That he don't fuck with Rob. Well, he don't fuck with the Starks. And he will not be giving shit. 
All right, Balon taking shit. So this puts Theon in the predicament. I can't wait to see how he uh tries to bounce back. Cause now he's gonna be overly tough guy, you know. Some Theon always pretended to be until he landed and was like, "Oh shit." Um, now let's go ahead and end this thing at King's Landing. Our boy Tyrion is doing his uh his hand to the king shit, and I gotta say, masterfully, masterfully. So Varys pays him a visit. Well. I love how when uh, Tyrion walks in to see his lady, there goes Varys just keeping her in conversation, giggling, kicking it up, if you will. And Shay is just enjoying it, like, oh, I love him. And then Varys is just letting him know, like, oh, it's so wonderful that you found her. Uh, at one of your fathers had your father had her as one of his cooks. Like, oh, even though I know she ain't supposed to be here. Like, I know your father said that. So Varys just quite subtly told him, let's be friends. I know the things you don't want nobody to know. And I like you. I'm a good friend. Friends don't tell. It was all about me and you team up. Let, let's do that. How about that? And I love Tyrion's reaction to those little subtleties that Varys in there through. He said, let me tell you something. You ain't going to be threatening me, uh, daddy-o. He said, I ain't Ned. I know how to play this game. I said, ooh, shots fired and too soon, Tyrion. Too soon. People are still tender about the beheading of Ned. Yes, he was dumb. We get it. Sure, he was too honest. Copy that. But the, the God damn it. Take it easy. Okay? Take it easy. It's some it's some Starkians who just still feel away about that Ned thing. And Varys was like, I don't remember threatening you. He was like, but while we on the case of uh, threats, let me tell you something. You could try to, all this trying to put me out to sea and do all this shit, you can try. But you'll find that uh, it won't be that easy. And consequences will follow. So please make your move. I said Varys is a bad motherfucker. Varys is a bad motherfucker. And at the same time, we get a little side of Littlefinger, Baelish. Now we know he's a snaky little piece of shit, but he also is like the Mac, right? He's like an OG pimp from one of those 70s black exploitation films. Like, he ain't going. But Shorty up in there crying, fucking up his money. He talking about what he do to bad investments. How he'll just sell it to win- to men who like to change and alter people. And I, he basically told Shorty, you are a commodity. Like, I understand you're sad. But nothing upsets me more than spending my money on some broke hoe. A broke hoe that's going to sit around crying and won't work. It, that doesn't work for me. You bring me my money. Now, you take a day. And you try to get happy. Because if not, <laughs> let's just say this. <laughs> my losses will be mitigated. I said, God damn, Bailey. She did, like, oh. Baelish could give a damn about cut up babies and sad whores. Like, he's about his dollar. He's got a goal. He's got a reputation. And we learned something else about these two. We learned that Varys ain't gonna take no shit. And we learned that Baelish is not finna lose. Not on no, he ain't finna lose out on no money. And you will not fuck with his reputation. I was like, these are there was some cold hearted shit going on this episode. So now I'm confused. As I read, live all these, as these, I see these things, I'm like, I don't know which one is my favorite dialogue scene. Because the one between Balon and Theon was fucking magnificent. How he just sh- totally destroyed every delusion Theon had. That was masterful. But Varys versus fucking um, Tyrion was great. Probably a little too soon, too quick. Of an interaction, that's probably why it takes out. But that Baelish storytelling, that's good competition, man. I don't know. I can't call it. I liked all four of those scenes highly. Highly. Mm. Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know what? I'm going to go with the Black Air Force ones because I don't want to get robbed. So I'm going to just say Theon and Balin was the best scene. I'm going to just stick to that. 
Okay, I don't want them. I don't need the great joys on my ass robbing me. So I'm just gonna roll with them because I can't make up my mind. But those are four magnificent scenes this episode. And uh, oh my god, I'm about to forget one right now. I was heading to the one with Tyrion and um Cersei. Oh shit! This Game of Thrones is so good for this reason here. These subtle dialogues and scheming and conversations are fucking it's a work of art i and i tried writing before i couldn't you nobody could fathom how hard it is to write this good like and have you belated to george r R. martin i was talking shit about him in the discord that's because people upset me so much about this damon shit but that's for house of the dragon i'll save it right now we're talking game of thrones but you Damon folks, you're very triggering. You're very triggering. But yeah, Cersei versus uh, Tyrion. This was an excellent uh, back and forth because here is where we learned two things. We learned that Cersei may not be as powerful as she claims. She, we, we saw her as a person that was running shit and... She may not be running shit. And we see her a little nervous that she ain't got a grip on Joffrey. And she's a little nervous that Tyrion sees this break now because he's like, oh, you killing babies? And you ain't even gonna deny it? And then he realizes, oh, wait, no, you didn't. Joffrey did it. And he said, fuck off to you. Okay, now we know how to work. You know, and he calls her out on that shit. And then he tells her about the, because he believes it. This whole, he makes a joke about Jamie being on her, you know. And so she's like, you know, that's funny. That's a funny joke. You always been funny. And we see that when Cersei gets hurt, she cuts deep. I've not ne- I I've what I've witnessed in two seasons so far. Tyrion be called imp, his life be threatened, him be told that he was gonna be a jackass. He even slept on the side of a goddamn wall with some crazy man coming in beating him with a stick never have i ever seen him hurt before not with by tywin or nobody but the words of cersei blaming him for the murder of their mother is the only time i've ever seen Tyrion. you saw his physical heartbreak like you saw that that cut deep there's certain shit you know even the prostitute story that was him like just getting it out there and he was kind of drunk and you know you could feel his sadness about it but at the end of it all he was just kind of whatever like it's been so many years but that mama shit Cersei knew just where to hit him and uh they cross they they set up their lines and they crossed them so there's going to be no teamwork that scene lets you know there's not going to be any teamwork between Tyrion and Cersei like Tyrion may have tried Cersei may have even tried because that's the game. But these two, it's done. This conversation lets you know they're not fucking with each other and they will constantly be each other's opposites going forward. They will never, maybe when it comes to his uh, nieces and nephews, Tyrion's nieces and nephews, that's probably the only thing, you know, because he does love them. He even loves Joffrey, but, you know. It's a little, it's a little funky out there with Joffrey right now. Um, was it? It was also something else with Tyrion. Oh yeah, Tyrion fired, uh, fired the Lord Commander, and made our boy, um, uh, what's his name? I can't think of his name, but made our boy the new Lord Commander. I like how Tyrion's running off his. <laughs> I like how he chose him too. He let him get his last little dinner in and said, "Yeah, we don't need your services because you didn't serve the last hand of the king so well." Like, you traded on him quite quickly. Like, you were easily purchased. And I said, right on, Tyrion. Why would you keep some unfaithful motherfucker talking about some I'm not to be bought? And he was like, yeah, that's because somebody else bought you earlier. So, cut the shit. And now he getting sent to Eastwatch. I said, well done, Tyrion. Right now, he is putting people in place that he can trust. Because you ain't finna ned him. That was Tyrion's main motivation. You ain't about to ned me. All right, and I respect it. Looking forward to uh, episode three, but that's next week. 
Next time I'll see y'all, I might got something on my sleeve. There's a lot of television out there I got to watch. A lot of reviews I want to get to. Um, Yeah. Protect your health, yourself, your wealth, man. Your boy Rell is out of here. Peace. Yo, I know I don't need no introduction, but y'all know who it is, man. It's your boy, Hollywood Rail. And I appreciate you for sliding through and watching these videos. But you know what I need from you? All right, if you ain't already, I need you to like this and subscribe this, man. We at 1,000 trying to get to two, all right? Push it for your boy. Get them algorithms up. So when it comes to that subscribe button...